So we're going to start out with some uh, prayers that we say before the teaching here. So we'll start out with the um, seven-line prayer to Guru Rinpoche. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, Endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When, I was supreme, when, when you, chief of humans, are born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, 
ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endow with supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endow with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endow with great compassion. Omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merit and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, released from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. Freedom for teaching of the path, well abiding in the pure training, holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms and atoms in all aspects. With supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusion, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to the merits of having attained the state of the all-seeing, thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. Present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma and samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other offerings and wealths and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer with you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send down waves of your blessings. Iddam guru ratna mandala kam nirhatayami. All right, so the heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on Mass Vulture's Mountain in Rajgira together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration of the category of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates as also empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra, the, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that in the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, 
Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharavati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no objects of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifest completely awakened to the unsurpassed, perfect and complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra, the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. So we'll say this one time together and then um, 20 times silently. Tayata gata gata paragata parasungata bodhisattva. Tayata gata gata paragata parasungata bodhisattva. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended the bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoiced. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Ashari Vajiputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounded in their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, Gandavaras, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. All right. Uh, all right, all right. To, fu to fulfill the needs of all beings and all their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser, greater, common, and extraordinary approaches. All right. Can we have a few minutes of uh, calm abiding meditation?
Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we're uh, and Lions are establishing this as a special holiday. Hope will be ongoing kindness day. <laughs> nice. I don't know. We need that. I'd like to read. Uh, I think Patty and Taruka and I were sitting around, which is the value of sitting around. And uh, of course, we've invented this thing called um, Middle Way Health Foundation. And um, <clears throat> we are. Uh, We have this clothing line called Wear Kindness. <laughs> so Turco was texting me uh, this morning and saying, you know, uh, if uh, we have a poster um, that says reasons to wear kindness, one, kindness is always a good look. <laughs> Two, when you wear this shirt, it's really embarrassing to be mean. So it helps you to be a nicer person. Yeah. <clears throat> Your donations for this product go to Middle Way Health Foundation. So whose mission is to uh, do uh, free psychotherapy and social work and consulting. <clears throat> So when um, teachers uh, uh, from a lineage side talk about their teacher, they, uh, they always remark on their kindness. I think people were um, kind of impressed when Kenshin Rinpoche was here a few months ago for the long life um, empowerment. Uh, he, he used um, our friend Herring as a translator, but then when he talked about his personal life, he went just talked to English off, kind of off script. Um, traditional teachers are very, very careful to be completely um, truthful and stick to the treatment plan when they're um, teaching formal dharma. But then they said, "Okay, now I'm just going to talk about me," and uh, uh, he. He mentioned uh, his uh, teacher's kindness, right? <clears throat> when we're wanting to generate the wish to benefit others, when we're trying to generate compassion, and uh, we're trying to generate bodhicitta, which is to become a uh, Buddha in order to benefit ourselves and others, um, uh, what's uh, always the, the go-to start traditionally? Well, how do you generate bodhicitta? You remember the kindness of your mother. <clears throat> so, uh, when we're trying to do Dharma Center here, we're trying to do a very interesting thing, combine a traditional um, lineage Dharma, which is archetypal and ritualistic and colorful with um, secular and scientific and uh, therapeutic modalities. <clears throat> I think my inspiration for my teachers, particularly the Dalai Lama, um, who uh, says maybe values is the way to bring uh, people together, or is really the most important thing to talk about. So his talks have been published in a more recent book, I think, called uh, Beyond, Beyond Buddhism, is that right? Oh, Beyond Religion, thank you. And then also Ethics for a New Millennium earlier, maybe 20 years ago. So people sometimes say, well, what, what is it that distinguishes uh, Buddha Dharma as a teaching, as a pedagogy? Um, of course, we have the truth. Um, we say there, there's a normative truth, but um, probably we'd more like. I'd like to say that it's about kindness. 
one of my teachers, Aiken Roshi, uh, Zen master who passed away a few years ago, said, well, it's human kindness, but it's also like cat kindness, dog kindness, mountain kindness, um, <clears throat> people who cut you off, and that freeway kindness. <laughs> so it's not, it's not that we're trying to be, his point was, I think, um, not that we should be, that we're generating kindness, we're noticing the kindness of mountains and rivers um, and people that cut us off in the freeway. Oh my God. So we're generating kindness by uh, remembering those uh, humans and animals and beings, archetypal beings too, um, imaginal beings that uh, have been kind and then we naturally want to respond with gratitude and kindness, don't you think? <clears throat> So kindness uh, day, um, <laughs> like, okay, 24 hours, can we do it? This is like the kindness challenge and something like that. Maybe we should get Oprah and um, <laughs> get going, right? <clears throat> so it helps, you know, I, um, usually I get up in the morning and I, I give myself, eat, wake up. Uh, sometimes it's wake up in the middle of a dream but I'm always going, okay, don't get mad today. <laughs> so, and I try to follow that, out, just be kind. So on the back of the temple, I don't know if everyone's been back there, walk around. So we have the, um, the murals. And uh, I wrote in the, up on the top, the Shambhala mural, just be kind. Um, it's become popular through the efforts of um, uh, people in America and um, Sharon Salzberg and um, Jack Cornfield, you know, and doing uh, what's called meta practice, right? Um, there's a text called the Metta Sutta, which um, has actually to do uh, technically with when you're alone in the jungle and you're worried about being bitten by snakes. <clears throat> That's a big thing in India. Actually getting bitten by anything is a big thing in India. But, uh, the conventional thing is like, be kind to the snakes and they, they won't bite you, right? It's uh, transactional, right? We're kind, maybe. No, the jerks won't get us. <clears throat> um, the bodhisattva practice uh, is also to be noticing and appreciating the kindness of snakes. That's sometimes more difficult, don't you think? I think it's really difficult. <clears throat> Lately, I've been practicing uh, the kindness of Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> Like this morning, like the power went off in Carmichael. Anybody in Carmichael lose power? Internet down too. Sabina's going, oh God, I got to go into the office now and I'm supposed to put the team together, da da da, like that, you know, assignments for the day. Um, <laughs> you know, like, oh, Kaiser. You know. So um, we just did a short, like, let's be kind to Kaiser. <laughs> I, I like magical thinking personally. Um, <laughs> I don't depend on it, okay? Just so you know. But so we did that, okay? And the internet came on. <laughs> like that. Or like just, you know, maybe, you know, kindness to smut or something. Like, <laughs> so there are two kind, you know, so in the tradition we call it, we're generating kindness from our side toward our, the people that may be wanting to harm us, which are enemies. Um, but usually metta, of course, or in Sanskrit, maitri is generated first kindness for people we, we love, feel close to, right? And then kindness 
uh, loving kindness for those we, we kind of feel neutral about, and then you know generating loving kindness for those who wish to harm us. <clears throat> That's extremely difficult practice, isn't it? Don't you think? I mean, even if someone criticizes us a little bit, you know, we just shower them with hot coals, right? So, um, I've had you know like the experiences of talking to people that. Um, uh, have had many um, traumas and injuries, and uh, they've been still able to, you know, generate some kindness. There's a famous Tibetan monk, Paul Dengatso, who's um, in prison for many years, and when he met um, Dalai Lama, I said, well, uh, did you, you know, what was it like in prison and being tortured? He said, well, I only got worried one time, really bad, I had one really bad day. I don't know how that's possible, they'd all be bad days, but um, he said, well, I, for a moment, I, I thought I'd lose bodhicitta, you know, that kindness of, and the motivation. These are extraordinary people. I'm not there, you know, so I'm not saying you have to be there, but uh, when we do the uh, Maitri practice or meta practice, that I hope will become more a part of um, our practice here. Um, you know, uh, and along with Tong Lan practice, uh, you know, start with the easy things first, right? That's always, uh, you know, we're, we're always very ambitious as Americans. Let's, let's just start out with people we don't like. No, don't, don't start there. You know, just start with, you know, uh, you know, probably the last person you should do is like, you know, your, you know, people you love, like, then uh, neutral people, then people want to harm you, and then work with your own inner critic and shame, right? Maybe that's the fourth one, right? But start with easy first. <clears throat> so that's why traditionally you'd start with people that have uh, healed you, um, given you teachings. Um, you know, our parents, like, like that. <clears throat> um, traditional Asia, maybe traditional people are archetypal. And by that, I mean that if, uh, if it's, you know, and say, uh, let's say, yeah, my mother was very kind. Uh, and based on that, I'm, I'm helping others. And then if you point it well, as a Westerner, you point it, well, you know, it looks like, she, you know, she could be, um, not nice all the time, <laughs> and uh, uh, they would say, I know that was for my own benefit. So uh, it looks like it's kind of putting things under the rug a little bit, you know, and say, okay, that's, God, you're all enmeshed and codependent. But um, in the, the thinking there, it's archetypal in that uh, the archetype, he's kind of Jungian term, is, uh, of, of a loving mother is very strong, you see. So the, there's some uh, distinction between our actual biological parents and even actual biological teachers and doctors and nurses and therapists and um, the, the archetype. So that's the interesting thing that I've always found with Fajana Buddhism is that we want to keep uh, the archetype from, uh, of course, being too inflated, grandiose, like, uh, Archetypal beings can, you know, rescue from from merited karma, but we also don't want to diminish the archetype. So when we're even generating kindness based on um, archetypal figures, even though they're personal, that there's a sense that we hold uh, those two together in the same um, person, like that. I think maybe we do that naturally, but. Um, that's a huge part of the practice with us, and particularly generating uh, loving kindness is that uh, we don't go to abstract um, love, and we don't go to overly particular either. We take the middle way. So we see someone's uh, transpersonal Buddha nature qualities at the same time we're seeing uh, their personal particular qualities. Maybe we can have a discussion about that in a moment. It's very difficult to keep those two together, right? Um, 
And in India, you have like regular snakes that are going to bite you. And then you have the Nagas. So when you're walking around, you're given instruction like, um, remember the Nagas, that is the snakes, sometimes like you and sometimes they don't. So the, the actual like snake or spider or scorpions, uh, they at the same time they have uh, this kind of archetypal world that is they still inhabit for you. It's interesting. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have uh, all the wear kindness T-shirts <laughs> over at Middleway Health, but um, maybe um, for the rest of the day we can have a sense where it means to um, exhibit it and to um, notice like where others have been kind to us and where, where we've been kind to others, including, um, you know, mountains and rivers and snakes and things like that. <clears throat> it's really hard to be kind when people are anonymous too. Um, so I try to be careful. Um, not to objectify and make um, our things anonymous. For me, Kaiser is not an archetype, um, but it's, a, it's kind of um, uh, what uh, we might call, uh, for those studying Dharma Kirti, kind of a universal, right? It, it doesn't really, it has some function because you can say go to the Kaiser ER, but uh, it, it doesn't have uh, uh, an actual reality. So a snake has an actual reality, uh, plus an archetypal reality as being a being, a naga, kind of, uh, that has its own interests, right? That also wants to take care of its uh, own, correct? But. Uh, the name Kaiser is just uh, um, a non-functioning uh, universal, just something we, we put like the collection. So uh, we, we can't really even, you can't even really get um, angry or really totally kind uh, to a, a universal. What do you think, those people that are studying? universals. Buddhism is big on uh, actually, well, our style anyway, fairly, in, in general, all of Buddhism is big on being an anomalist. So what's real is what's particular and present. Um, so uh, there's, there's no, there's real trees, but there's no like platonic uh, tree, image of tree out there. But the mind can form like uh, a, a generalized image, right? A concept of tree or concept of Kaiser. So uh, when to generate kindness toward um, an impersonal and um, dysfunctional health system, uh, you know, maybe we have to like bring in some of the personal people and archetypally add them to uh, the system. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, one of the former chiefs of psychiatry at Kaiser is actually a Zen student, you know, um, Sabine and I know him, so <laughs> whenever we'd see him, we'd say, uh, please, please be the archetype for Kaiser, because <laughs> he was super nice, right? You know, so so we're taking the personal and, and bringing in some kind of archetypal energy into a system that could just be uh, a conceptual overlay. So, sorry this talk is kind of technical, but this is what happens when you get up in the morning and you read Dharmakirti and Buddhist logic and epistemology for an hour, right? So, so in generating kindness, uh, when I talk about the archetypal, I'm not talking about just a generalized thing. I'm talking about uh, a felt sense that um, 
isn't just uh, uh, related um, uh, to particular actions. Uh, and the archetype uh, is an energetic system that uh, can express itself in individual actions, but um, can appear in different ways. Does it sound kind of fuzzy? It is a little fuzzy, but uh, when we think about it, uh, loving kindness uh, and love is a little bit hard to pin down too, don't you think? So when we're generating kindness, it's important not to be have the conceptual overlay of it, but to have the heartfelt um, universal sense uh, in that archetypal way, not in the collective way, and also the particular sense. So when we're doing loving kindness meditation, uh, we're thinking of a particular person, but that particular person or situation or a snake or person that's cut us off at traffic um, uh, is able to stand for and open up a vision to others. So in Buddhist thinking, uh, the, uh, these images like you see around the you know tankas, they're meant to be archetypal images that are uh, effective doorways into seeing interdependence. Otherwise, in a nominalist position, um, you don't see interdependence. You see isolated individuals that you might be kind to, but you don't see the interconnections. Because it's funny, you don't really see interdependence, right? You know, we say, okay, there's, I don't know, how many people, 16 people, so sitting here, right? So you don't really see, you see 16 people, but do you, how do you see uh, that we're connected? Do you, do you go to, an, do you go to a, like a conceptual image, like we're all showing up in the same place? It doesn't feel very heart-centered, does it? Does it to you? It doesn't feel heart-centered. Well, our, our connection is we're all in the same place. It's true, but that's not interdependence by itself, right? So uh, interdependence uh, has a quality of both being uh, particular and um, uh, general without being a uh, conceptual overlay. I'm give, trying to give a very um, a scholarly talk about absolute and relative truth, but without losing the heartfelt uh, aspect of loving kindness, right? <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, all I wanted to say right now. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank people for. Uh, tuning in um, in video land. Um, we're, we're awaiting, I'm awaiting a, a little bigger um, laptop, you know, the biggest. So I can, I can see people a little bit bigger. <clears throat> um, sometimes bigger is better, okay? So, <laughs> so I don't want to just, I just don't want to see like a name and like, so, uh, very conceptual is like, I could look like there's Zima, okay? So, but that's just <laughs> Elizabeth, okay? So, but I, I, I want a little, even if it's just, you know, kind of uh, electronic, I want to see a little bigger picture, right? So it's not just, just the conceptual uh, identification, okay? Because that, that would be what would be like, if we take that as being real, then we're lost in the universal, even even with a particular name. Oh, that's Elizabeth Zima. You know, so I, I, want, I want as much as I can uh, a felt presence, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do all these meditations, like, you know, projecting uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas from us, and then uh, and reabsorbing them, and then, having them do all kinds of interesting things um, because uh, through the proper use of imagination, it actually brings our mind more into the present. It's kind of weird to put it that way, right? Some schools of Dharma think, oh, okay, if we just get rid of all thought and all imagination, we will see things as they actually are, right? 
that's tempting to think like that, right? Like just wipe the mind clean, have no thoughts. My old teacher said, well, that's why you drink and do drugs. <laughs> he was saying that to me, this is years ago. I'm like, oh, okay. So, and uh, we understand the role of the imaginal, the archetypal, that actually brings us into the present, but has is this uh, kind of magical world of interdependence and connection at the same time. So the unity of the, the particular and the archetypal uh, uh, is most epitomized by this loving kindness, you know, very, um, that uh, bodhicitta practice, right? So uh, I know I said I was gonna stop here, but then, so is it possible we could have some discussion Yeah, we have the famous mic that you then turn on the back. And then there are people remotely. Yeah. Is it fun to see people on the big screens there? Does that help? Yeah. I'm just kind of, okay. Uh, yeah. So see, I, I can't see enough to go, okay, this person has a question or not, see, so I need a moderator. Yeah. Mama, it's Ellen. Andrew and I have questions. Okay, go. Well, I, I've been thinking about this um, archetype since you mentioned Kaiser. And, you know, it strikes me that Kaiser is kind of a, I, I think you're using it sort of as a lighthearted example, but this is really important because we do this all the time with, you know, Republicans and Democrats or like Rick used to always blame it on the liberals. And he'd talk about that with me sitting in the room, you know, forgetting that I was actually a liberal. Um, but as I wonder, is the goal to, um, to develop the loving kindness to this imaginary institution that we sort of reify as a real thing? Or is it to sort of dissolve the reification and recognize that there are, you know, human beings that are mothers or could have been mothers or had mothers? Or do we work at it from both angles? Uh, we don't want to take the, the name concept and then uh, reify that and call it an archetype. Uh, you, you want to keep the, the personal still connected. So, uh, you know, with like institutions like that. Yeah. So um, I try to think uh, of at least three people I know in Kaiser. So I got one gimme, Sabrina, and then... <laughs> <laughs> then I try to think of two others. So see that as a uh, interconnected system. So uh, the idea of a system is kind of an archetype, you see, because you can't quite see it in the same way that you can see individuals, right? You can't see like, you know, you know we can express loving kindness and love and bodhicitta and all that, but uh, you, you don't quite see it the same way you see uh, objects or you see um, a conceptual object. So um, I like to start from, uh, you know, from the person and, and build the persons together and then um, see a, a sense of system that connects. Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, so maybe, you know, psychologically has some Maybe I'm influenced by all my Gestalt training, you know, like that, that Gestalt, like that German word for holes. You know, I'm, I'm very interested how we um, see things as holes, you know, a whole, whole persons, are a, a whole thing, without at the same time uh, separating from our actual perception and the actual present now. Like that. So I see Kaiser as a fiction, um, but then, uh, you know, I try to think, well, there are, these, uh, there are these people working in this system that we're nominally calling Kaiser, but the system is the real archetype. If people are working together, then they are. 
Yeah, that's helpful because I do find myself getting angry with institutions sometimes that then I can never find a person in the institution that I'm actually angry with. So I'm angry with something that isn't really real. So I think it is yeah. to examine it. So thank you. Yeah. So all that Dharma Kirti reading is paying off, I think, Ellen. Well, maybe it will start to. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to really examine how we reify things. Um, look deeply how we objectify um so you know like uh you know we're, we're very conscious of not um objectifying people's uh, racial and sexual um uh identities at this point but uh you know we we also have to create um a, a new sense so we don't you know objectify institutions you know because and then we'd be, of course, you know, we're objectifying lion's roar and all that stuff, you know. It's, it's just, uh, so there's some British, you know, philosophers like, uh, you know, logic, you know, maybe Quine and um, people like that, that, you know, used to teach at Cambridge. So I've told this before, but I like the story. So I'll tell it again where, um, Suppose a person comes, they want to matriculate at Cambridge, they say, I'd like a tour of the university. And so the person says, okay, and here's, here's the quad, here's, the, here's the, the resident houses, here's, uh, here's the dining hall, here's the chapel, and then they come back to the administration office and the um, guide says, well, how'd you like the university? And the person said, well, I, I really didn't see the university. I, I saw, you know, the quad, I saw the resident houses, I saw that chapel and so forth. So there's something wrong there, right? Where there's a misunderstanding of particulars and universals. And uh, when we're doing Dharma practice, uh, we try not to get caught in either extreme. We try to do the middle way like that. Well, let's see, someone else had something to say. Mama Angie has his hands up. Oh, okay. That's good. We'll get back to Andrea. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. I don't know if you ever read the book Sapiens. This is guy, it's an Israeli guy. He's a, he's a Vipassana practitioner. He would go on retreats for a year or two and then write a book. And the central tenet was all kind of this institutional abstract thinking actually that's what separates sapiens from uh the other like neanderthals where had bigger brains than us apparently mm -hmm. and i think so i some maybe someone has read the book more recently than i i don't remember the final point but i remember him basically saying that we need to watch out for the subjectification like the idea of the united states there is no united states where is it you know the mm -hmm. idea of a dollar bill well, what is that that's because the united states says this mm -hmm. is meaning something um, what is Buddhism? You know, show me Buddhism on a map. Uh, so all these things, they can be very helpful to us, but they're also, in his view, they're also detrimental. It's a lot. It's basically the cause of a lot of the world's problems, the tribalism we have all over the world, <clears throat> the, the fighting between religions. So I think his idea was basically mm -hmm. to, to pierce the veil um, of this kind of objectification. At the same time, maybe you can use these archetypes. What are the things? Yeah, good point, John. Yeah. So I, I've heard the book. Uh, like many things are behind in that kind of reading, but um, one of the things that uh, 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 George Dreyfus points out in the Dharmakirti book is that there's problems with a two nominalist position too, right? Because even though we say universals don't have um, as strong as reality as our particulars, they, they do something, they have some function, right? They allow us to identify and to orient, right? You know, kind of fingered to the moon. So um, we we can't we can't do without them, right? You know, they they have they have that. So uh, one of the big discussion points in uh, you know Buddhist practice is you know how, how much are you know are these kind of universals helpful, and how much you know did they get in the way like that? And of course, we usually get into the weeds. You're talking about you know what kind of ontological status do they have like that but um generally uh 
we're not Platonists, you know, we're more like Aristotle. So uh, the, the, um, we're going to start with observation rather than with um, the idea. Platonists, um, there may be some of you in the room, and I don't want to insult you. <laughs> but Platonists start with the ideal, right? And then try to uh, bring that into the world. You know, uh, more Aristotelians or more nominalists, we, we start with the particular and try to find the connections. Going rational to empirical, you're going from empirical to rational? Yes. So that, you know, based on that, that's why, you know, I, uh, the core of Dharma is very, you know, empirical and scientific at heart. But we, we don't throw out archetypal and uh, universals and ideas, you know, um, all together. We're just trying to find the right middle way. Are you, are you, you're not, you're probably an Aristotelian at heart, I can tell you. I don't know. I, I sometimes I think, well, <laughs> maybe we need to do a little bit of both. I, but yeah. <laughs> it, the platonic is very, it's very seductive, right? Yeah. It's very, you know, we just you know, live in our ideas. And the Buddha said, yes, there's these realms where um, the beings are just, they don't have any bodies. They're just ideas. They're idea beings, you know. We're, we're in the uh, Kama Loka, and then this, you know, the, the desire realm, and then there's the form realm, and then there's the formless realm, and um, where, you know, you have the perception of uh, neither anything nor not anything. And the Buddha said, no, this isn't, my teacher has taught me to stay in that exalted realm, but that's not, um, that's not awakening. But I think a lot of meditators think, oh, I just, if I stay in this zone, then I'm awakened, right? But we're not Platonists. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> I think Andrew is somewhere. Where's Andrew? Hi, Lama. Andrew, your beard's looking good. Uh -huh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, when you were talking about um, seeing the kindness in uh, people that we don't wouldn't only see that like the, the jerks if you will yeah. um it it feels like kind of ninja level buddhism to be able to do that it, it kind of reminds me of the um in the eight verses i think it's verse six when someone has harmed me i see them as my teacher um and of course that is very valuable and very important and i, I take what you're saying is uh very helpful it, it reminded me of, I'm sure you're familiar with forgiveness studies um, in, in psychology. There's this, as I understand it, there's this concept that uh, when you're forgiving someone, it's kind of more for you almost than them because you're letting go of your suffering. Um, mm -hmm. And I wondered how that would fit in with this. Like, in terms of generating loving kindness, is there, is there room for this forgiveness, and how would that be perceived within the Dharma? Yeah, that's big. Um, years ago, I, uh, before I knew anybody here except Peter or Hanowitz, uh, I tried doing um, some of the reconciliation things of Thich Nhat Han, you know. Um, of course, we you know he went into Parinirvana recently. Um, <laughs> I wasn't good at it. It was a complete failure. <laughs> I wouldn't say complete failure, but it's really hard to do, you know, like, uh, so, and then, um, of course, we know Bishop Desmond Tutu passed away recently, and um, uh, he was, he and his, um, I think, daughter, or be driving forth of the truth and reconciliation, you know, project. Uh, it's amazing, you know, they have a book on that. Um, I don't know, you know, that that's high level kindness practice. You know, when we're, you know, doing that forgiveness practice. Um, Luntuk and I put together some booklets on reestablishing harmony that we may have to, uh, you know, pull pull out because of some recent misunderstandings here at the temple. But, you know, real, 
you know, like the in South Africa, the Bishop Tudor did, like, I don't know how people do it. It's like, I call it, you know, transhuman, right? Because um, he got uh, that project, you know, the, the perpetrators, the murderers and the victims, you know, to talk to each other. Um, and, and sometimes it worked, I know sometimes it didn't, but that, that's, that's high level Maitri practice, right? You know, we're sitting on the cushion and kind of, I'm really comfortable and sitting in Manaus House and Carmichael or Fair Oaks or Land Park. And, and, you know, that's one thing, but, you know, to work with these really difficult situations is, um, you know, something that uh, I want to investigate like that. You know, um, the, the closest I've come to, like, um, that kind of truth and reconciliation practice um, uh, that uh, probably Andrew and other people can appreciate is couple therapy. <laughs> Say to any therapist, couple therapy, and they go, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, you know, because when someone's been betrayed, you know, like a Ferris and betrayal, and then you have two people in a room, and sometimes uh, it's coming out right in the session, right? Whoa, right? So that's why therapists um, generally, I don't know, well, I do, but most like the, there's a clear path to the door. <laughs> so always put the mail closest to the door. I'm slamming guys, but it's true. I, I, uh, it's always, a, I don't know, I wouldn't say, I should never say never or always, but in my experience, it's always the man that walks out. Maybe, maybe it's, I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, other data. You know, this is anecdotal, of course, but that would be a dissertation. Like, men that walk out of couple therapy sessions, dude, you're the cheater, and you walk out. Okay, you're not forgiving me, right? That's the standard, right? Did it, it's over, let's get, let's get past this. You know, so it's really hard. That's really hard work. You know, so then you can't say to the agreed party, okay, just generate loving kindness. Let's forgive them. You know, so it, we, we have, you know, it has to be, you know, a really strong loving kindness or strong, you know, practice like that. But I, I hope we can do some of that, you know, uh, maybe through the temple, but it's, uh, you know, take some, take some work, don't you think? <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. Okay, hi, Sarah. Thank you. Um, good morning again. I think in your example, uh, I, I start meta practice with myself. And I do think the importance about loving kindness is when you have to, well, you don't have to do anything. When you try to generate it for people who you don't like, I do think on some level it has to first start with you. You're doing it to yeah. help yourself in this relationship and this interdependence with this other person. And so like, there's not so much of a difference between this person and me, it's something's going on here and how do we generate some kindness for the connection? Less like the discrete me, you, somebody else I don't know, some system. Then maybe it's about generating kindness towards the relationship, interdependence, the thing that's arising, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. You know, so Thanks. that's what's interesting is, you know, sometimes talk to a couple like they'll say times, you know, I think feel this about you or him. I feel this about her, and then. Then we switch to this interesting animal called the relationship. You know, where, where does that exist? You know, the relationship. Um, so I find it helpful uh, to do both things. You know, just say I'm really worried about you. Let's talk about alcohol and drug 
you know, Peter, I'm really worried about you, and I'm really worried about the relationship. So it's really interesting to to work on that. And thank you for that. Yeah, we, we need there, there's this weird thing called the relationship, and we need to generate a love for for the relationship um, because uh, lots of times we really don't like the other person, but <laughs> but we, we we love the relationship. We want the relationship to endure, even though the actual you know object person, as we'd say in object relations, you know, isn't somebody that we feel loving towards at the time. It's interesting. Lama, we have a question for, from Marie and then also from Dirk. Oh, okay, good. Hi, Lama, La. it's Marie. Um, this is more along the lines of just uh, actually an invitation. Uh, for people to uh, come to the Tong Lung group if they're interested on the third Friday. And um, I would just like to say that, you know, this is something that you started talking with me about many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've really tried to uh, put your teachings into practice. And I truly believe that it has changed things and changed my relationship with both myself and with other people. So it truly can be transformative and it, it changes your relationship with time and mm. uh, with the ability to uh, pause mm. and become more present and, and really kind of see both of the tracks that are going on, right? That, that relative thing, but then also the ultimate part that's going on. So I truly do believe that this is something that's a really valuable skill. At least it has been really for me. So. Yeah, thank you for bringing up you know, probably um, just to define like Tonglin and sending and taking. So we're sending out our uh, energy, love and breath and we're being receptive and taking in, so to speak, you know, uh, someone's pain. It's uh, one of the exercises or slogans in the seven point mind training. So um, I do recommend uh, Pema Chodron's books. Um, some of the, I, I like calling Pema Chodron Tonglen Rinpoche. <laughs> uh, there's a, uh, uh, her tongue is very, you know, accepting and uh, soft to have backbone. Uh, um, there's also, um, you know, kind of a more yang tongue where, of course, Marie and I have talked where um, uh, you work, you know, you work with criticism, right? So, but we'll talk more about that. We only have a few minutes, so. But thank you for mentioning that. And we need to get um, putting. I'm glad for your shouting out. Well, let's promote that more, okay? Yeah. So, then, okay. Hi, hi, Dirk. Hi, Lama. Hi. Uh, I was. Uh, I'm. I'm kind of falling back to the universal particular uh, because. While you were talking about it, I was thinking about this universal that I refer to as Dirk or me or I, which is kind of a collection in a lot of ways, just like Kaiser is. <laughs> so many, I mean, there's, you know, all of these cells in the body and the brain and the, all of the, all of the, uh, the skandharas <laughs> that all of the unconscious material that constantly is uh coming through and controlling things that i have that when i think of identifying myself as as i and i do a practice of loving kindness towards me who is that anyway <laughs> that's sort of a universe that in a way i'm just another universal it seems Yes. <laughs> so we, we love your universal, Dirk. 
a bigger part. I, I, what did you say? I love your universal. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's uh, part of our deep meditation that we, um, you know, go searching for this uh, uh, self. You know, if it exists. The way we usually think of it, we should be able to find it the way we usually think of it, right? But uh, the interesting part is when we go search for it systematically, um, it doesn't appear the way it, sh it seems to appear um, in regular discourse. So uh, that's an enormous big piece of uh, Maitri training is that when we combine uh, the, you know, understanding how uh, uh, self functions, so to speak, as a designation instead of uh, universal, and we combine that with um, the aspirational, uh, emotional side and um, activity side of love, then uh, it really becomes radiant, don't you think? You know, and then that's when we're um, uh, entering the world of Dzogchen. Um, Sometimes when we're reading Dzogchen texts, you know, they, they seem very kind of heady and um, Mahamudra too, but um, the foundation of all that uh, is bodhicitta, is uh, loving kindness and aspiration. And um, uh, so uh, without that bodhicitta, without the loving kindness, you won't be able to come to full realization. So I, I'm glad you, you know, brought that up. Um, so, um, in, in Dharma, uh, we, we don't hate delusions, you know, we, we actually love them. <laughs> Not that we're affirming them, but like, I'm, you know, it's like, I'm so happy you have a totally delusional idea, you know, um, um, because of course we don't meet the delusions, we just meet the people, right? You know, so um, in hospital work, I mean, I know through personal experience and hospital work, present work, like no one wants to be psychotic, right? No, no one, no one wants to be mentally ill. No one says, I, I want to be that way, right? So uh, we, we do, we do in a way also in Dharma, um, the delusions are dissolved through love. <laughs> I'm raving to Dirk. He's got this really nice. <laughs> this is like that. You can see it, like the books, and then the tanka. That's very uh, classical. Thank you. So we're we we're, we're out of time. We should do closing prayers. Thank you for people's patience today. Hmm. In here, in um, the when the dedication practice, you know, we take it actually really serious. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to be very secular, you could say, "I just want to be a good person." But it's not arrogant in our tradition to say, you know, "I, I want to be Buddha." Why not? We want to be awake, right? So that's that's why we make this dedication. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right, so we're going to do the dedication on page 15. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Chenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholder of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, 
Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasury of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire hosts of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land stages, Losangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Yes, I, I just wanted to remind everybody that Kenshin Rinpoche will be here on February 20th to give a teaching on um, Succession Guru Yoga. And also um, on March 6th, if you, you might not have seen in the roar, but we're going to have a special Entering the Path ceremony. And that's a really special day, and you'll hear more about that um, in the near future. And then... Um, and then for finally, if we have a, a donor box here, but we don't have one, a, a, like a physical one online, but there's a little button. If you could put in a few dollars here and there, that is so helpful to us if that's done on a regular basis. So thank you so much. And I'll see if anyone else has an announcement. Oh, yes. Okay. Susan has an announcement too. Hi. Um, I'm going to try to get on camera, if you don't mind. There we go. Hi, um, I'm Susan, and uh, this is a follow-up to what Patty was announcing with Kenshin Rinpoche. We'll be here in just a couple of weeks. And so what that does, now that we're opening up, give us an opportunity to come together and to help, um, and we need your help, to um, make this event successful and really worthwhile and happy for all of us. Um, so just the kind of things that we need are people to help with a potluck, bringing stuff, setting up, that kind of thing. Um, there's an opportunity to learn things like maybe setting up the altar um, and setting up the throne and other kinds of sort of ceremonial things that we need to do. And Lung Tuck is Tech. Okay, and yeah. so we also can really use some help. Lungto can definitely use some help in terms of the technical um, aspects of, of going online as well as being in person. So anybody who is interested, and including all y'all online who might be able to come into the temple on that day, um, give me a, a buzz, um, a phone call, an email, or Patty, and let us know if you would be willing to help us out in some aspect or another. We haven't really got, you know, things totally organized yet, but we've kind of done this before, and so we can give you an idea of where we might need help, and you can give us an idea of where you would like to help. So um, anyway, I'll be around for a while, so we'll Patty. And um, you just give us your contact information. Put what? Okay. Um, for those of you who are online, you could send an email to info at lions. Is it lions or dharma center dot org? Yeah, an email to info at lions or dharma center dot org and say, yeah, I'd like to help, and either Susan or Patty will get back to you, or Lumtok if you want to help with the tech stuff. So, okay, that's it. Thank you. One, one of the privileges of um, being a lineage lama is that I get to call out people in the audience. Um, so I just want to call out, um, you know, uh, one who's probably not listening because he's working, but uh, Dr. Justin Alchu is here, so uh, my personal physician and um, was available, really nice. Um, I've had really good health the last two years, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, uh, and I give, you know, credit to Sabina too, who's, you know, <laughs> just like sneeze. Well, do you want to go to the ER? No, it's not that bad, but, uh, 
you know, it's uh, really a privilege to work with uh, caring, loving professionals who are friends. And, you know, so I, I really feel more energetic than I have. I, I do not feel, you know, I, I also, always emotionally, I feel like 14 years old. That's probably my developmental, you know, ceiling. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, just knowing that there are loving, helping people around, that, that is so important too, right? So, you know, the psychological benefits of saying, oh, someone's really available and someone who has expertise and someone knows you personally, you know, that's, that's Dharma. So thank you so much. All right. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama La.